Humans form groups to achieve goals that no individual can accomplish alone, such as dropping basketballs into well-defended baskets or inventing a vaccine against the coronavirus. Over the years, our lab has been particularly interested in how effective coordination in a group can emerge even when the members cannot explicitly communicate with one another. Out of the broader collective of collaborations that I have been involved in, I would like to focus on three projects um, by co-authors that are highlighted with the glowing letters because they converge on some general principles for achieving well-coordinated groups. So uh, the first paradigm, part of Michael Roberts' PhD thesis, is somewhat obscurely called group binary search and is based on a game you used to play with your grandparent, where they would think up a random number between one and a hundred, and you make successive guesses, and they provide feedback after each guess on whether your guess was too high, too low, or just right. Ten-year-olds find this game pretty easy, and the game becomes downright trivial if your grandparent tells you exactly how much you're too high or too low by. If you guessed 50 and your grandparent says you're too low by 29, then you know the number is 79. In our group version of this game, a computer replaces the grandparent and thinks up a random number between one and 100. Group sizes range from two to 17 players, and every member guesses a number between one and 100. The computer adds up all of the guesses and compares this sum to its mystery number, providing exact feedback to every group member about how much the group was off by. For example, if members of a four-person group guess the numbers 20, 40, 20, and 20, and the computer was thinking of the number 88, then they would all be told that they were too high by 12. Reacting to the feedback on the next round, they might all guess smaller numbers, 10, 10, 16, and 17. But now they have undershot the mystery number and the computer tells them that they are now collectively too low by 35. This game is harder than the single player version because the players don't know how each other are going to respond to the feedback. So using this paradigm, we find that small groups do better than large groups because it's harder to coordinate a larger group as we all know from trying to go out to dinner with a 15 person group at a normal cognitive science conference meeting. But there are things that help the large groups to coordinate. Namely, members of the group adopt different roles over time, roles based upon how much they react to the computer supplied feedback. So this plot shows the individual guesses and the group sum over the course of one randomly chosen game in which the group took 14 rounds to guess the mystery number. You'll notice that some individuals pretty much keep the same guess from round to round, no matter whether the group is too high or too low, but other individuals react strongly to the round by round feedback. We measure a player's reactivity by how much they increase their guesses when their group was too low and decrease their guesses when their group was too high. Using this measure of reactivity, we find that players adopt different rules in two different senses. The variability of reactivity within a player decreases as the experiment goes on, and the variability across players is going to increase over time. And to me, this gives a good gloss on what we mean by an adaptive role specialization within a group. Consistency of behavior within a person and differentiation of behavior across people. Furthermore, we find that the extent to which individuals in a group differentiate themselves into roles predicts how quickly the group will reach the mystery number, particularly so for large groups. The computational model that performed the best and also performed most like our participants was one in which the agents decreased their reactivity whenever the computer supplied feedback changes its direction from too high to too low. 
while also trying to differentiate their reactivity from others. In a second paradigm that Robert Hawkins and I call Battle of the Exes, two players are tasked with moving their avatars to one of two different targets that offer different reward amounts. In this example, both players would prefer four cents over one cent, but there's a second condition, which is that if both players move to the same target, then neither player gets any reward for that try. Half of the dyads played under a dynamic condition in which they can see each other's step-by-step -step movements and can change their course at any time before one of them reaches a target. The other half play under a ballistic condition in which each of the players first selects a target and only after the targets are selected by both agents will both agents see the step-by-step -step movements of each other. Also, half of the dyads played under relatively high stakes of four cents versus one cent, while the other half of dyads played under lower stakes of two cents versus one cent and the groups played about 60 rounds in all. Now sometimes dyads stumbled across clever strategies like turn taking, even though we never mentioned this as a possibility. For example, the red player would move to the large payoff on the odd trials, whereas the, the blue player would move to the large payoff on the even trials. And this is a good solution in three senses that have been well articulated within game theory. This solution of turn taking is efficient, defined as the players getting high payoffs. The solution is fair, defined as players getting similar amounts of money. And the solution is stable, defined as how predictable in an information theoretic sense are the two players' choices from round to round. As shown in these results, player solutions tend to become more efficient and more fair when they can see each other's step-by-step -step movements than when they can't. An implication of these results is that giving the members in a group more information about what each person in the group is currently thinking about can help the group achieve well-coordinated, fair, and happy solutions. In terms of developing stable solutions, we see a strong interaction between payoffs and movement type. When the stakes were low, shown in green here, then players in the dynamic condition simply relied on moment-to-moment -moment visual information to figure out who should get the larger payoff and who should get the smaller payoff. They did not feel a strong pressure to develop a norm because they could use the continuously supplied information as a crutch to help them coordinate. However, when the, sta when the stakes were high, then the dynamic condition developed significantly more stable solutions than the ballistic condition. So for particularly contentious, high stakes situations, it is useful for the players to develop strong norms like turn taking in order to help them coordinate and avoid conflict. And the moment to moment information about player positions helps them to create those norms. Okay, in the third coordination paradigm, Edgar, Andre, Lotero, and I came up with a task in which two players are simultaneously trying to guess whether a unicorn is present or absent in an eight by eight grid of tiles. Players can turn over a tile to see if a unicorn is underneath it. The players get points for correctly guessing whether the unicorn is present or absent, but each time both players turn over the same tile, points are deducted. So the players will score better if they turn over complementary sets of tiles. The players can see what each other's present or absent guess currently is. And when the players select an overlapping tile, it is immediately shown in blue to both players. Players very often, about 57% of the dyads, learn to effectively coordinate with each other. 
This is almost always achieved by players settling in on complementary focal regions as shown here. Um, for example, one player would turn over all of the tiles on the left side and the other player would turn over all of the tiles on the right side or splitting up the grid into top and bottom tiles or inside and outside or sometimes one player overturning all of the tiles while the other player doesn't turn over any tiles at all. And these two plots give clues as to how the players are often able to achieve good coordination. The plot on the left shows a strong relation such that as the player's scores on the previous round increase, they are more likely to be consistent, to keep the same strategy for turning over trials that they used on the last round. This is a version of the common win-stay-lose-shift reinforcement learning strategy. But in addition to this strategy, we also find that as a player's set of overturned tiles become increasingly similar to one of the focal regions, then they are also more likely to consistently choose the same strategy on the next round. So players are more stubborn when they're selecting a set of tiles that could coordinate well with the other player, assuming that the other player can gravitate toward the complementary focal region. Of the three computational models that we tested, the model that performs the best both in terms of achieving the most efficient and stable division of labor and fitting human dyads the best, is a model that has biases towards focal regions and keeps its current tile selections if the strategy is scoring well or if it's close to a focal region. If neither is true, then there's a tendency for the model to select the complementary focal region to the other player's focal region. For example, choosing the left tiles when the other player chooses right tiles. Okay, so now segueing to generalizations from these three paradigms, the first obvious commonality is that good group coordination often involves not the members all doing the same thing at the same time, but rather a division of labor. Some players reacting to feedback while other players stay put. One player going for one cent when the other player goes for four cents, or one player uncovering the top tiles when the other player uncovers the bottom tiles. This leads to the second generalization, which is successful division of labor is facilitated when players assume specialized, differentiated roles. Our formalized notion of a role has two components, the player being consistent with their own behavior, and being differentiated from the other players. Players are turning themselves into modules of a larger system. And this leads to the final point. Although modules in cognitive science are often understood as being stupid, automatic, informationally encapsulated, the modules that the players turn themselves into here are strategically constructed. The computational models that fit the human behavior the best are also the ones that have mechanisms to strategically differentiate a player's behavior from others to fit well with what the player thinks the other players are trying to do. In some cases, there probably is competition between levels of systems, and the more the individuals selfishly care about themselves, the less coherent the group will be. But at least in the paradigms that I presented here, the opposite seems to be true. One of the things that smart people do is make smart groups. Okay, thanks very much.